I'm Stembridge. I'm going to try and walk you through my experiences in mainframe processing. Uh, I'll give you a little bit more detail as we go along uh, and we'll just go from there. So I'll try and go along for a while. I know people are going to have questions. Um, I'll try and do uh, time breaks uh, not too far apart so that people can uh, get their questions in for sure. For an outline for tonight, we're going to go back to uh, one of the pioneers of, as I know it, data processing, Grace Hopper. How mainframes have been used um, in the public sector and private sector early, the early usage. Um, the gobbledygook that you see here are various operating systems uh, from an IBM perspective. Um, pretty much all of my experience in the mainframe arena was on IBM. Uh, so everything from the early OS 360 down to ZOS. A uh, little bit on mainframe computer languages and how some of them differ. Uh, storage, because you can have all the computing power in the world, but if you don't have, uh, if you can't get to your data, it eh, really doesn't mean anything. Various inputs uh, that were used on, in the arena during the years. Um, access methods and how the data was um, processed um, and gathered and to be used. Um, networks, which are pretty important these days, and finishing it up with outputs that um, that come out of come out of that process. So, um, this would have been me on my first day reporting to work, um, as people generally. I, it took me a while to get used to uh, being referred to as a dinosaur, but um, after a while, it was um, I, I looked at it as a badge of honor, actually. Um, to give you some more background about myself, uh, all of my experience was in banking and financial services. Uh, having worked with local companies in the Boston area, the old First National Bank of Boston, different iterations of names, Bank Boston, Bank of Boston, uh, merged with a bank called Fleet, and then finally um, Bank of America. All large institutions with large processing facilities that just got larger along the way, sure. So, um, Grace Hopper, um, as I try to allude to, is one of the pioneers of, um, of computers in terms of coming along, um, having gotten a, a degree from Yale in mathematics in the 30s, and then going to work, uh, uh, joining the Navy. Uh, in terms of the work she did to basically design, uh, work with um, vet, um, probably did the most to contribute to the COBOL language. Um, and a um, lot, lot, lot of good other things. Yes, she was the first to discover um, a computer bug. Hopefully I'll explain that in a minute. Um, as I said, she was creating accredited with creating, um, mostly creating COBOL. Uh, she attained the rank of uh, Navy uh, Rear Admiral, for sure. Um, worked on various um, machines, um, UNIVAC 1 being one of them. And uh, before she passed away, uh, two years ago, I believe, uh, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So, uh, the ASSC Harvard Mark I, the Automated Sequence Controlled Calculator. You can see where the machine is. This, this is where it would have started to refer to 
these these types of machines as being as big as a room because it was as big as a room. Um, processing uh, these machines at those days were basically large calculators in terms of be being able to crunch numbers um, at a pretty good rate, sure. Um, this would be the bug. One day, um, processing just wasn't going right on on the uh, Mark on Mark One, and I have to give it to how they could find such a small bug and such a large machine for sure. Obviously, pretty good detective work. Um, the really uses of mainframes from the forties on. Uh, the public, public sector, the U.S. government, uh, in terms of doing the funding and the research that went into those types of things. Um, Department of Defense, late in World War II, uh, Census Bureau, and I think you can see the other uses that were made um, by the government for this new technology at the time. Um, private, private sector, um, Engineering, banking, airlines, this approximately in the 50s going into the 1960s. Uh, the UNIVAC 1 was the first machine used um, by the government um, in this capacity for the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, I believe it was 1951 this, this was put in. Um, put into use. Um, operating systems. Um, the operating system, as folks may know, uh, is that part of the system which controls what type of processing, how it's done, um, and uses whatever capacity is given to it. Um, from the mainframe side, um, these, as I referred to before, the OS 360, um, up to the latest version of ZOS. Other operating systems that people use, one way or another, um, would be Mac OS, or as we were talking about earlier, Windows. Um, probably the most popular operating systems that people know of would be Android and iPhone, because I'm sure everyone on this call is using one or the other um, every day and every way, pretty much. Um, for mainframe operating systems, um, the brains of the mainframe and, and later on servers, um, one that has endured for the longest and is still pretty much in use in one way, shape, or form, um, was MVS, multiple virtual storage. Separate virtual memories for individual multiple task partitions. Um, going back to the OS 360, which was um, introduced in roughly 1964, were single partition machines. Um, in terms of not multitasking, but pretty much single tasking and running different applications at different times and one region of the machine. So whichever one had priority, be that payroll, uh, be that checking accounts, being whatever, that's what ran on the machine at the time. From 75 to 79 was OS 370, and then into MVS and multiple iterations. Uh, this is where the multitasking came about in the mainframe environment. Um, in terms of looking over here, an application would be able to process and look like it had literally the machine on its own. Whereas in fact, um, it shared the machine 
with different applications and, and was able to retrieve process data from separate sections on the, on, on the, on the machine's environment also. Um, and that's what, that's what was, happened here and then literally up to, up to today. Um, in terms of computer languages, uh, procedural languages such as COBOL, PL1, um, have gone back a long way. I'll, I'll digress for a moment um, because I think many of us have heard of um, issues that states are having processing their unemployment claims these days. Um, because m m a lot of governmental processing was built on these machines using a lot of these languages, and there aren't a whole lot of people left around who can process them, for sure, or know how, know how to code um, in these particular languages to make um, these machines, to, to get these claims out faster unfortunately. Um, in terms of the mainframes, we're all, uh, later on, we're able to process, we're able to run code, um, Unix, uh, C, C language, and that's been since a little over ooh, 25 years, approximately, almost 25 years. Uh, Java and HTML came along to be processed on the machines approximately uh, year 2000. Um, an IBM MBS system was comprised of various of different components. The core processing or systems that, subsystems that were used on these machines uh, with TSO, a time sharing option in terms of being able to log into the machines and actually um, do a certain type of work um, on the old green screens. Um, ISPF, the Inter Interactive Structured Pro Productivity Facility, he tried to say, um, was a template that was um, laid over the time sharing option in terms of um, menu driven systems and processes that. Um, were a lot that one one could do different types of, of work on. Um, Jazz two for the job entry subsystem. One of the main functions of mainframes was a thing called batch processing, in terms of collecting um, transactions generated by online systems. Um, banking systems or other types to, that were uh, generated during the day and typically processed at night um, through batch jobs, as they were called, as they are called, um, to process the data to bring an update up to date for the next day. Uh, and, that was, and that was controlled by JES. DFSMS, Data Facility Storage Management Facility controls the, pro, um, the, the storage function of processing data on, uh, on disk or DASD um, and on uh, tape and basically any, any other type of data that can be processed and used in the systems out there. I'll go to the next slide. Um, any questions before I go ahead at this point? Okay. Um, programming languages on the mainframe. Norm? Yep. Yes, Ab. I do have a question. So, when you were working with these contraptions, was there a sort of exciting sense that you were on the cutting edge at the time? Um, Yes and no. Uh, and 
I may have not even had the privilege, for lack of a better word, of experiencing that. Only because, like, um, like a lot of things, it was an everyday job in terms of um, learning the technology, being able to uh, put together plans to u utilize the technology, and to move forward with it. Um, I know very, I knew very little about banking. I was fortunate enough that I knew a lot about computers. Um, it was, there was a period where not a lot was expected from the environment, so to speak. Um, okay, uh, you guys can do these things one at a time. When we were able, when we moved to a, uh, a point where we could process multiple workloads um, at the same time uh, in a secure environment and um, being able to process it faster and faster, yeah, that, ooh, this is, this is pretty good. Um, in terms of the some of the other technology that was used, um, once um, the, it was upgraded, um, we were able to process much more data again at uh, at faster rates. Yeah, then it got exciting for sure. You know, um, when <clears throat> when it would take four hours to process something um, and we got to a point where we could pretty much cut that in half, cut that time in half. Yeah. Um, it, it's a good question. It's a good question you ask because I appreciated it the further I got away from it, for sure. Mm. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, machine language is the close is the code that runs on the machines, actually. Um, other languages such as Assembler, uh, COBOL, Fortran, whatever, have to be compiled, basically. Um, whether it was for business purposes or scientific purposes, um, that had to be broken down into very basic instructions so that the, so that the mainframes, um, in this case, could understand it and be able to process it. Uh, later on came non-procedural languages, um, database generators, things like RPG. Um, and this is where the compilers became not as necessary. Uh, they were able, able literally to code it um, put it onto the machine and pretty much run from there, sure, with, without um, the interim step. Um, same thing for things like Visual Basic um, and, of course, um, something uh, in terms of hypertext mark markup language, HTML. Um, once, the once the world started to move away from proprietary systems and make um, the processing available to larger segments of, of especially of the business world. Um, Question. Yes. Was uh, machine language um, running directly on the machine without an operating system? Or was uh, that the operating system? No, it, it, um, it interfaced with the, uh, the operating system, always ruled, and the machine language was, the, um, was what the, the operating system understood, basically. If I might add to this, the machine language is what the operating system uses to control the machine. Okay. So it's it integral is, to the OS the machine, versus... Uh... The machine language is the zeros and ones. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Can I toss something in? Very good, Steve. Go ahead. The, 
that the point is that machine language in zeros and ones and assembler right above it is what the processor itself talks in. There's a one-to-one -one correlation. So when, you're, when you write one line of code in assembler, you issue a single instruction that in, in what, what was we call now a CPU, but what the processor can understand and do one single step. The operating system was always there, but it was meant to control the program. So the way it worked is that the operating system would temporarily give up control of the processor to the assembly language or machine language that was running and just keep an eye on it to make sure it didn't violate any rules. Very good. Very good explanation, Jeff. Um, so um, a little bit more on those various languages. Um, the the high-level language, the procedural languages are referred to as high-level languages. Um, and the non-procedural languages, things like SQL, RPG, moving forward to C, C++. Um, um, again, didn't have to be compiled. And um, eventually broken down into ones and zeros, but without having to, be, having to go to that extra step, step of compilation. Um, an example of a COBOL program, small co co COBOL program, well, <clears throat> um, in terms of how these are put together, how various fields are defined, and every one of them has to be defined for sure, um, how going into a process as to, and, um, and how that those statements are then used to do whatever function is going to be um, is going to be needed, and I couldn't get every all of this onto one screen, but basically what we're coming down to is using all of these things to ask this question or the statement here. And as you can see on the side where um, there are other components of that. It's not necessarily apples to apples, but in terms of being able to do the same thing using HTML is pretty much what this comes down to. Well, a little different in terms of, um, in terms of, <laughs> Um, the coding that's needed uh, to, to process things. Um, the IBM 360. Uh, still in terms of single process functioning, um, you process payroll, you process, again, checking accounts, you process some single piece of work at the time to get it done. Um, with the, with the, um, with the IBM 360 allowed, um, IBM to do was to put together a set of instructions, uh, to process the work that could be expanded on going forward to succeeding operating systems. So, um, whatever was done here was the basis for moving forward um, into the main framework. With something like an, um, the OS 370 environment, um, this uh, still with the same um, peripheral equipment in terms of tape drives, in terms of printers, console. Um, again, more processing power and at this time, moving away from single task processing to the multiple task processing. A manager who used to um, who managed uh, one of our top technical groups 
Um, as we started to move on, the machines became more and more boring. And it was at this point he said, you know, we ought to just keep the, the face of the machine uh, to, sh to be able to ship when we had tours and people came through to be able to show them all, all the flashing lights. Um, because without, um, because that, that kept people's attention. Uh, they could actually literally see the work being processed by the, by the flickering lights. Later on, they just disappeared into um, mainframe history. Um, one of the important things for, for uh, processing moving forward was the three-tier uh, architecture. The presentation tier, um, sitting at a device, uh, a terminal, so to speak, in those days, or a desktop or something like that these days. Um, the application tier, which processed the work um, where the programs uh, ran um, and did, did the processing that was necessary. And the data tier, where um, whether it resided on a database or in some other format um, to be accessed and used. Um, what that allowed was for the separation of, of functions. Um, there was such a thing as one tier architecture where everything ran in one, in one single environment and wasn't separated. Um, much, much like a laptop, literally, these days. Um, in terms of, um, the, well, there was two-tier processing where um, the client and the, and the server, uh, mainframe, whatever type of machinery would do the processing. Um, and then, of course, databases, which pretty much literally had to be separate at some, at some point in time because they just became so big. Um, and you just didn't want anyone playing around with them anyway. Um, hey, Norm, yes. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so I'm, what I'm thinking is that um, this structure that you're describing is the abstract structure. We've got the client, like your phone or your computer. You've got the server and the database. Could you give a concrete example of what you work with in this, the, it, with these three layers? So we get a, a deeper feel for what the three tiers are. Um, and in a previous life, um, I would have, <coughs> excuse me, um, myself or someone in my organization would have logged on to, uh, as I said, a, 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 <coughs> a, term, a terminal or some type of emulator that would look into the system. Um, so that would sit on someone's desktop. And basically, that's how they would look to interact with the system. Um, their interaction would have then gone to the mainframe or the server. Because, again, that's where, um, as they entered commands into the system, um, the mainframe or the server, that's where they were going to be processed. Uh, so, and... So the database, the database is, sounds like it was kind of stupid. It was basically just basically a big closet, and it was the server that made all the decisions about picking data. And or you, you, you said, I want to do this. The server interprets it, interpreted that, and then sent, and then sent, the com sent those commands along out to the database to, um, to process what you want, what you need to process. Mm -hmm. So... Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, Can I ask one quick question before you continue? Go right ahead, Drew. Uh, the database that you were referring to there, what was the, was it, was those um, in, in the, those tapes that spun around in circles or what was the that, storage medium? Um, that was one of them, yes. Uh, the tape was um, the round reel tapes were input or output 
um, wasn't necessarily the I'm trying to say uh, the server didn't necessarily process it um, until it was finished with it. It either took the data from the tape, the input from the tape, um, brought that into processing, and then if the tape was going to be used as the output medium, uh, placed it there. Um, early on, that was a big part of the processing. Um, and then into the 70s and definitely by the 80s, um, the DASD devices, direct access storage devices, or DISC, um, became the, um, the main type of data where the data would reside. And those became, those became the underlying for the databases themselves. Hey, Adam? Yes. Can I offer you a different answer to your question? Uh, sure. Initially, when we coded, the, the program did everything. It painted the screens. I mean, when we had tubes, you did all the processing, all the logic in the program, and you also handled your own data. You read and you wrote your own database. You know, think of the old DBase type programs. And then as things progressed, they started separating the components. So the concept of three tier was that they, they broke into three pieces where you had the front end, which was just the display portion, the IO that was occurring, you know, between the keyboard, the screen and the user. The server part was the central piece where all the processing was done. And now you had your database operations being broken off in a back end. Think of, you know, MS SQL as, as we've got it today, where it's just a, a back end process whose job it is just to handle data and, and hand out results. So that, that was the beginnings of three tier architecture. Thank you. That's really helpful. It does seem like there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of flow now in this three tiers. Like sometimes now a lot of processing is done at the local machine, unlike this dumb terminal we're looking at right now. And this seems to be a much more fluid. Sometimes the processing is done on a website. Sometimes it's done in some back end somewhere. Mm -hmm. It seems like it, it now it's much more confusing and obscure. Uh, so I actually found it very refreshing, Norm, to see this three tiered architecture in this. It's like learning Latin. It's like learning, it's just a much more fixed structured system than we have now. Um, and basically to provide, what I'm trying to say, uh, a separation of components, literally not putting all your all your eggs in one basket. Yes. And and having and if that basket falls, everything goes. So. Yeah, I add to this as well. Sure. The, yeah. the uh, server uh, can be written in such a way so that it can interface with a different. Uh, if you go back to that one slide, it might help a little bit. Previous slide, the uh, server can interface with many different types of clients. You saw one on the screen he just left, which was an IBM terminal. Uh, nowadays, uh, this could be a PC. It could be other types of terminals. I know Hewlett Packard had terminals and so forth, and they all had different types of interfaces. So the server would be able to talk to each of those clients. In addition, the uh, server or possibly other uh, peers in here would have information about what's in the database and how to go about using it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the example of the dumb terminal, uh, nothing that you could walk around with for sure. Um, going on to, uh, the same, another view of the same item and not to be much along the lines of in creativity, but, uh, one of the early IBM, uh, personal computers. Looked a lot like the dump terminal. Sure. Uh, storage devices and management. Um, I'm going to basically go through, try and go through from the 70s to the 90s. Um, changed somewhat after that, but not a lot. Um, the, what made 
what made the mainframes tick a lot were devices like this, um, direct access storage device. Uh, what, what, is, well, Norm, what does servo feedback technology mean? Um, basically, it was a better way of recording the data. It allowed the data to be um, more, more bits and more bytes jammed onto the devices that we use for processing. Um, um, so what went from we were able to uh, double, tr triple the amount of data that could be placed on these devices um, and cut down on errors that could have possibly happened. So, but was there a major change? When I, I'm hearing in servo feedback, like there was some kind of change. It sounds like before that, they just put stuff on, on media. And this sounds like a more intelligent servo feedback. Sounds like there's some kind of conversation going on. Is that um, what's happening? Basically, yes. Um, in previous um, iterations, there wasn't necessarily a lot of data of, of checking of the data and verifying it. Um, so you may have gone through an entire process um, and gotten to the end and it just, the data was no good. Whereas the, um, this allowed that processing to write, verify, write, verify, mm -hmm. um, and let you know if there was a, a problem before you got two hours down the road. Um, that's, um, as I recall, that, 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 that's what it did. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I'm sorry. So these devices, um, yes, the IBM 3330, these were, and these were removable discs. Um, so, of course, if you're, that type of technology was necessary because the more you, these, uh, these things would go into these compartments to process. And of course, the more you handle things, the more likely something's going to go wrong or it drops or falls or whatever, or gets scratched. Um, and that, that's, um, so to move forward, that was part, part of the process. Um, in the 1980s, came along devices called the 3380, uh, 3380s, um, which were, and I'm only going to be able to get into it so much. Besides, I don't want I don't want too many people falling asleep too much. Um, in terms of a better technology to be able to, in a non-technical way of saying it, cram more data onto these devices um, and basically the devices, the heads of these disks were able to um, process even much more data in a faster, uh, in a, in a faster amount of time and literally flying above the uh, above the device uh, to be able to retrieve the data that much faster. Um, so, Norm, can I ask a, a commercial question here? Sure. One thing I, I, I read in 1980 or thereabouts was that IBM was larger than all the other computer companies combined. And so I was intrigued that they would come up with this technology and then basically sell it. It just has a very different feel than the world now. Where you have these different companies and some, of, you know, some bright guy will, will come up with some clever idea, he'll do a IPO, he'll become a multi-billionaire and suddenly this company appears on the scene. This seems like a much more old fashioned kind of business model uh, that was going on at the time. It, it, it would, um, for those who are uh, approximately the same age as I will, it was a different world um, in terms of the large companies 
um, would employ thousands of people, uh, in this case, engineers and others, um, to be able to put forth a product and move it forward. Um, and yes, they were, they were a, I, in terms of the mainframe, even today, um, they had, I'm going, I, I can't say directly, but 70% um, of the market, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, they got real good at what they did and got real big to do it. So. Um, third iteration uh, into the 1990s would have been the 3390 uh, DASI model. Uh, in this case, Mod 3. Um, the capacities um, really don't seem, compared to today's environments, um, the capacities of these devices doesn't seem like a lot. Believe me, it was. Um, and, these were, and these were the types of things, um, these were the types of devices that the databases were, uh, resided on uh, for quick access, um, for quick access uh, from multiple sources um, that just were able to serve that data back faster than fast, for lack of a better description. Um, access me methods. Um, depending on the device and uh, would typically say how the data was going to be accessed. Um, the QSAM method, uh, Q sequential access method, tape a lot of DASTY in terms of records, uh, data being separated into records, those records being accessed one after another, after another, sequentially, basically. Um, BSAM was more for the online environments, online systems, um, teller systems, um, those types of things, um, which was basically uh, BDAM in terms of now being able to go directly to a record, basically. If you had a file that had 1,000 records um, in, the old, in the olden days, you would, you would go record by record to get to that, uh, to get to the, to, the dip, to the place on the file that you wanted to. Using BDAM, it was able uh, by some, using some type of key, an account number, a uh, record number, whatever, it would be able to go exactly to that point uh, to, be, to be able to process that data. Um, BPAM was for, uh, used a lot under the, the TSO subsystem. Um, partition data sets that held programs, um, text, uh, but that was divided into individual members um, to be able to be accessed online. Uh, VSAM, virtual sequential access method, was able to take advantage of the virtual partitions in the machine, um, move the data to one, uh, to one virtual location, um, and the, the system and the programs were still able to find it and then go ahead and process it. Um, um, Norma, are these? The, is only one of them. Like, is, is, is most things VSAM now? Uh, yes. Um, QSAM is uh, not as heavily utilized as it used to be. Uh, so probably BDAM and, but VSAM, I think, 
um, by and large, is would be, and I, as far as I recall, um, having left it a while ago, in an IBM environment, a lot of the data would be accessed um, using vSAM. Sure. And, and I guess this asks, uh, raises a larger question, which is those of us, most of us here, I'm speaking for myself, I have almost no direct contact with mainframes. Right. I, except my guess is when I go to the ATM machine, I'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, Adam. Jeff? Jeff? Never mind. That's all right. Go ahead. Okay. If it comes, comes up, it comes around on the guitar. Just, just speak up. No, I was going to give you a very quick answer to what you just asked. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Different perspectives, I think, are really helpful. Access method, as they defined it, was very tied to the type of storage device. So when you had tape, it was, it was sequential. There was no really random access because you'd, you'd have to spin the tape like crazy. So <laughs> the reason they had so many different access methods is because they had so many different types of storage. And as storage is the nature of storage became random, then they could implement random types of access methods to get to that data. So that's what that layout really was about. It, it, it's the sequence of how storage progressed, so the access methods progressed. Yeah, that, make, that makes total sense. Anyone who's used, who, who used tape to do like a data restore knows, knows how miserable it is. And <laughs> once, once you have direct access to stuff, um, things are much nicer. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I could, could spend a lot of time on it, but the different um, DASI devices, or the 3390s in this case, um, the last number indicating um, the evolution in terms of how many, um, the measurement was in cylinders as to how, um, how much data, one of the measurements was in cylinders in terms of how much data it could hold, which broke down to the number of tracks, um, which broke down to the, um, to the amount of and bytes on those particular devices, uh, as you can see, all, all incrementing, for sure, um, and the number of bytes per track, which was um, I can't remember the exact reason, but being fixed for sure. So, um, and yeah, these suffice to say they they start they they held a lot of, they held a lot of, they hold a lot of data for sure. Um, um, what do you do with the data? How do you define it? How do you set it up? Um, one of the things I hear now um, in terms of measuring things, um, quantifying uh, our data sets, um, a collection of like data uh, to be processed for a certain, uh, for a certain purpose. Um, these, these would, um, it, these data sets would exist on different storage devices, tape uh, or, or disk. And basically, in this case, uh, there was something called GDGs, generation data groups, um, in terms of think of the structure as uh, grandfather, father, son. One led to the other. One led to the next one, to the next one. If you had, um, at the end of the day, all the transactions were gathered. Um, those transactions were applied to a file, typically a master file or a history file, um, which was going to be different from the day before and was going to be different from the next day. But you had to be able to capture that and isolated, so to speak, so that if there were inquiries that are needed, 
uh, processing that had to go back and be redone, um, those um, they, were, they were always available so that you could do that. You wouldn't want it not to be available for sure. Um, and this is just an example of another way to create, um, I'll just say that um, in this case, for the data set, for the data set name that was to be created and assigned, um, this, using it this way, would then increment so that it would go from five to six to seven to eight. Um, and there would be those individual, individual data sets, um, which again were available for later, later processing. Some of the old inputs, as you can see, um, because one of the things people always identify with mainframe is punch cards, um, which actually came about long before mainframe, but um, we won't go there. Uh, 80 columns, 80, um, 80, 80 bytes of data. Um, and um, not a lot of data storage, shall we say. Um, but these, I'm guessing they're probably no longer in use, but I wouldn't rule it out just in case. Um, data entry was a huge part of mainframe operations in terms of taking the, um, creating transactions, um, data that needed to be input into the system. Um, these, uh, for the time, eh, I, I, I'm not sure I should say, but uh, could be relatively high speed devices at for that time period. Um, Mark, uh, yeah. Is there, uh, could you comment on the fact that every single person in this picture is a, appears to be a woman? Um, this is being, this is being recorded, uh, so, so. Well, <laughs> but, but, but was that the case that a lot of data entry was done by secretarial staff who were mostly women? Wasn't necessarily secretarial, uh, by females, yes. Uh, and ter remember, this is basically, however you want to look at it, some form of typing. Um, and being able to be, uh, to have the dexterity to type without many errors um, and being able to concentrate, uh, I would say that um, females were especially suited for the task at hand. Um, the later that evolved, but yes, um, that that had a lot to do with it for sure. Um, they 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 typically paid attention very well and had a lot less errors than any male um, peer would have. Can I toss something in? Sure, Jeff. Adam, did you ever see the Hidden Figures movie? I haven't seen it, but I've heard about it. Well, watch that, and you'll get an insight into your answer. <laughs> of, of that. Would you would you agree, Norm? You're very good, Jeff. Very good. <laughs> what is going on that for the audience? Like, uh, what do you mean? Well, it it it, it was the women at NASA who were the those were the first ones who got their hands on on, on bare IBM computers, um, and, and and they depicted a whole lot better than I can explain it, but. It was, it was a burgeoning industry. I mean, it was, it was wide open. And at the same time, from a male perspective, it was considered, um, I don't know if a step down or inferior or what the right word oh, is. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but that is how it became, uh, you put the two together and, and, and that accounts for what you're seeing here. Hey, uh, I, find this really, I find this really intriguing 
um, when I was a computer science major in college, there were two women and 20, 20 guys. Okay. Um, going, going, going back to someone like Grace Hopper early in the presentation, yeah. she was an exception. Um, she was very much an exception in terms of breaking into uh, this industry. Um, Jeff, I, 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 I'll go with what Jeff said. You get a chance, watch, watch Hidden Figures. It'll be explained to you in no uncertain terms. Thank you. Um, I, I have to speak out now, um, and I probably have to edit this out of the... Uh, <laughs> no, wait, wait a minute. Um, are you saying that uh, the fact that a person has an XX chromosome means that they're better capable of doing such uh, data as this than someone who has an XY chromosome? Uh, that, that's because, been my... Uh, I think it's because they're women, and women were at that time put in lower levels of positions and weren't allowed to excel. I've worked with a lot of excellent women uh, software engineers. And I don't think sex has anything to do with it other than suppression from the uh, environment and the, um, what do they call it? Uh, I'm, around. In terms, yes, you're right. Um, but the fact that I don't think most males would have put themselves in, in, certain, in that position also, I think has a lot to do with it. That's because they could get around, get away with uh, putting women in those positions and threatening them having no position at all. And this is not at all related to the topic right now. So um, I will uh, mute me and stay that way. Well, I, I really appreciate people raising these issues. I think it's really important that we be think. I think uh, if we look at the population of Bina, for example, mm -hmm. um, we are an overwhelmingly male organization. Um, and I think it'd be, it's a really interesting question to try to understand what's happened in our field. And also I hope to be a positive influence going forward to make, to make what Steve is said, what Steve is fundamentally saying, which is that we should, every single individual, regardless of what their gender is, should be able to excel and do a really good job in what they want to do. And so we, um, we should, I hope we'll I, bear that in mind. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try not to get up on the soapbox. Um, but in this case, this would have been 60, almost 70 years, well, 60 years ago, approximately. Um, again, it was a different world. Then. Yes. Uh, pe people were more regulated to certain roles um, and, and perceptions, basically. Yes. Perceptions ruled, ruled those world, ruled those roles. Um, and unfortunately, I think we're at a point in this country where we're literally trying to roll back, back that way. Um, That's really unfortunate. I'm just looking at these women and observing that they're in a windowless room, more or less. Which, which, was, which was common for operation settings at the, in those days, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, I, I'll go there. I have a real problem with something like make America great again, because I think we're still great. Um, and uh, that brings up visions. That brings up to me a vision of wanting to go back to something like this. Yes, yes. Um, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. No, thanks for saying that. I think it's important. Um, round real tapes. Uh, System 370. Um, the, the device that I was familiar with was called IBM uh, 3420. Um, held a good amount of data for the time. Uh, I think I can't. Gee, I can't. I, I got some of my screen cut off, so I can't say exactly um, what it says there. But um, I'm sure it's still in use. Uh, not not much, but I'm I'm guessing they're still out there. They're still out there on this planet somewhere. For sure. Uh, these were the devices that uh, that were used for the for the tape. These were the actual tape drives, um, which did got re relatively sophisticated especially in terms of um, error checking, 
um, try, again, verifying the data um, af after it was written. Could it be read? Um, so there were, there were workhorses. These were workhorses from the 60s uh, right up until the 2000s, for sure. Uh, decreased usage, but still, still pretty good devices. Which then were pretty much replaced by the uh, IBM 34, 3480 um, tape sub, subsystem. Um, a lot smaller footprint to an extent. Um, a lot more sophisticated in terms of how they could process data, recover data, um, need be. Um, those types of things. Um, you can see the um, difference between the two media types. Um, they were very different. Um, and the even with the compactness of the cartridge drive, of the cartridges, um, they were able to hold up to, uh, I believe it was 200, 200 gig, um, I believe. So um, pretty dependable devices. It was, uh, I can interrupt. Yep. Uh, they used to have those at the MBTA. And uh, it was two different types. One, I think, was uh, 500 megabyte, and the other was 2 gigabyte mm. on those. But that was back in the day where uh, uh, the data that, you, that was on there was everything you needed. It wasn't uh, some instruction to the machine to, to display this, that, or the other thing. It was basically raw data. I also remember uh, my first job in computing uh, field service was with Honeywell. And I was at the First National Bank of Boston on uh, Morrissey Boulevard there. And they had a Honeywell uh, 800 system, yep. one of the machines they had. Yep. And it used three-quarter inch tapes on metal, metal reels. You got to work out changing those tapes. <laughs> so with... Uh, with that, I'll uh, I'll mute up again, and uh, that's about all. Okay. So, can I get in a question before we continue? Yes, sure. yes. Um, what we're looking at here is a big roll of magnetic tape. I guess. Yes. Yes. Now, suppose the data that I need to access is towards the middle of the spindle. Okay. How, how many? How much? How much time in like seconds, minutes, hours does it take to unroll that tape and get to my data? Uh, depending if if what you need is actually in the middle, um, seeking it sequentially, uh, it would be there in a couple of minutes. It probably a little less. Depending on the on the speed of the transport of the drive, that uh, was the the type of data that was on there, um, yeah, those those would be the different types of factors that would make sure um, that that would influence how how fast it got there. But um, they were, um, uh, as you someone alluded to earlier. Um, I, I worked for years um, on, on Morrison Boulevard's in the bank. Um, and the Honeywell 800s were just about, they were there uh, when I got there. Um, and maybe within five years or so, we went to all IPM. Um, for the round reels, uh, is actually where, I'm sorry. Um, Early eight, early into the mid eighties, uh, probably a little bit before that, was where compression came for. Um, in terms of being able to write more data um, onto the same um, amount of storage, uh, and that continued along 
that type of compression becoming even more so um, continued along onto the cartridges for sure. I, Norm, one thing that, struck, that Andrew's comment brings to mind is that it does sound like in these mainframe environments, there's less junk in the data than, than in our environments, if you see what I mean. Meaning that it seems like these devices, they have things like bank, vast numbers of bank transactions, like deposits and uh, withdrawals, um, yeah. instead of the email that you sent to your boss or you know, the, the, the video of your kid that, that made its way into the company, company records. Like, it just seems like this was a much more focused effort and, you, and your, your data responsibilities were much more targeted at transactional data than this much more uh, fluid and complicated data world that we have today. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, um, because that's what the business needs dictated at the time. And all of that and, and the above have now literally been incorporated into the into the environment uh, because how much how much business is done on via email tape isn't necessarily the medium for it because that's not what you you want to wait for someone to mount so um, so that you can access it to get whatever you need from there um, that's why the disk storage devices got bigger so they could hold that stuff also. Yes, I'm wondering whether, whether having a, a division might, might make sense. Like the way our systems work now, every, all the data sloshing together. Mm -hmm. I kind of, I'm intrigued by this, because I'm wondering, I find in my work with computer systems that sometimes having a dedicated system that just does one thing really, really well, oh, yeah. is better than a universal system that does all kinds of stuff. And so I'm wondering if even though we've advanced to these fancy web server, client server, cloud-based uh, super stuff, I'm wondering whether for a lot of work that needs to get done, I'm wondering whether these basically simple systems with simple data requirements, not small, I'm not saying small data requirements, but simple data requirements, might actually continue to have their place and maybe always will have their place. Oh, the, um, that... What you said is in place now um, in terms of the capacity of the machines, uh, the level of importance that different business units have, um, and who gets to say who, who gets to say what data is more important um, based on what tier literally it, sh it should be in. Um, how, how does it go in the uh, in the corporate world these days? Um, the A suite, the B suite, the C suite. You could you can imagine that all of those are categorized, and they're going to be able to get their to their data faster than oh some clerk sitting um, sitting behind the desk. Thank you. Um, moving forward in the world of tape to the IBM thirty four ninety e. Um, a rack mounted tape drive, um, able to transfer data up to three megabytes a second, pretty freaking fast, uh, for lack of a better technical description. Um, and to allow to hold up to 20, uh, from, from a native, if I, remember correctly, from a native amount of eight gigabytes up to 24 gigabytes compressed. Um, again, and even a pretty small footprint for sure. Um, and that and all of those devices have led up to the automated tape libraries. Um, <laughs> devices that held lots and lots of data um, where a robot um, is able to read read the bar barcoded labels to get 
uh, the, the volume that is needed and to uh, make it available for processing. And likewise, when it's finished, to be able to put it away. Um, this is when, this was one of the things that led to um, dark data centers, light cell processing, in terms of fewer and fewer human beings being involved and having to deal with them. Um, which moves along to uh, 2014, this particular device. Um, this um, automated tape library, which will hold up to a mere 351 petabytes data. Um, these are the types of devices where, as the Amazons, the Walmarts, the targets have collected all of that history on us. Um, and you need your order, or you need to look at your orders from going back a couple of years. More than likely, this is where something like that's going to be. Um, but the fact that it can be retrieved, not as the data can be retrieved, not as fast as this storage, uh, but for something older, which is going to have be access less and doesn't need to be um, back with lightning speed. These are the perfect types of devices for that. Um, up to three years ago now, approximately, um, the IBM Z15, um, ZOS, uh, the different types of operating systems. Uh, ZOS, ZOS processors allowed workloads to be processed um, in an MVS environment, Linux, Java, and a lot of process of internet processing, especially large institutions are done on these types of machines these days. Um, you know, I'll, yes, yes, COBOL could still run on it, but, um, but whatever type of processing you're doing um, these days, whatever type of coding can also run on these machines. Um, and they Norman, may, Norman but, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, I know that organizations like Amazon and Google use vast numbers of basically PCs in mm -hmm. huge racks. <laughs> how do how did that how does that approach compare to this approach? Are they comparable? Are they are they really different? Um, it all all depends. Uh, those the clients that you use these days. Um, whether they're connected directly to a mainframe or wherever they come in through the network can be routed through these types of devices. Um, so when, again, when you log on from home, when you log on from home and you want to check on your orders from uh, what you ordered from Amazon, you possibly may be going through something like this. Um, the shift came from not as much mainframe proprietary processing to literally a server-based model, which was able to uh, provide even, even more power um, and to be able to route what you were doing in, in, in a more in a more secure manner, so um, so probably somewhere along the lines, if I'm hearing it correctly, when you um, log in to do whatever function that is, you possibly could be going through this. It it, it all looks just like um, you know whether it's Microsoft um, or, or even Mac, for sure. 
but in the background, these um, that somewhere along the line, those those commands are probably going through something like this. So these devices that this device that we're looking at is very popular and is in a lot of different big companies now. And I'm, 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 I'm getting there. I'm, I'm trying to get there. I'll be fine. The short answer would be yes. <laughs> okay. Ah, I didn't remember what the next slide. Uses of the mainframe computer these days. Yes. Um, electronic records uh, and healthcare. Um, vast, mil vast military plan. Uh, banking for sure. These are the um, these are the top uses for the mainframes these days. So, um, and how do they decide? Look, I never really understood what what a room, a huge room server farm filled with PCs, how those could actually be effective in doing big big data processing. Yeah. Uh, how does using a mainframe compare with that approach? Is is it radically different, or is it just like a just a different two different ways of doing the same thing? Um, two two different ways of doing the same thing. Okay. Um, and I wish I could give <laughs> I wish I could give a better detailed detailed answer. Um, the cost of maintaining the environment. Um, it, what's, what do you get more bang for the buck from? A uh, hundred, a hundred servers, uh, or 15 mainframes. I'm willing to bet, uh, after you deal with the software licensing, um, the maintenance, uh, whatever goes into it, I'm, my money says that these are still in the largest scale that you have to deal with. Um, my, my money is that what's gonna come out of that process, that um, design process is probably, um, is a number of mainframes in there somewhere. So you said earlier that um, in the midst of even handling unemployment compensation right now, there are old, older systems that are still in place, and I assume that some of those systems have been replaced by newer systems. Is there, like, where are these programmers coming from? Like, it, like there, there aren't really schools where you learn this. Um, where is the, is there, is, is there been a turnover? Are there a lot of old guys just hanging around near these mainframes? Who are actually managing these mainframes now? Um, well, basically, <coughs> excuse me, um, in a lot of cases, they maintain themselves, you know, uh, in terms of how they do, uh, in terms of the, well, in one respect, in terms of the self-monitoring that they do, in terms of the uh, reporting, the reporting systems that run on to generate to say, yeah, this is working, or hello, this ain't working over here. Um, in terms of the actual coding for what needs to be done, yeah, that's a that's a lot small audience these days. Do you think there are fewer people actually required for this whole infrastructure than, than in your day? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, because one of the things that G, I just want to just point out that G's comment is a lot of this stuff is now outsourced. To India, um, in some way, shape, uh, the monitoring of it, um, the again the reporting from in terms of the usage, uh, the folks in even the folks in India are, are coming back to data centers in America where the where the work is being processed. They may be watching it, but they're not necessarily doing it. Um, in the in the way in the classic way that I would I as I know for sure, um, you know you have you know I'll try not to get back up on the soapbox. 
you have these large data centers sitting on land that's already owned in America, and you just you just plug a network into it, and you can get from wherever wherever you are in the world, and you can pay people a lot cheaper. Thank you. Um, so yeah, this is um, you know we're as um, you know, the, the, these are these are these are, yeah, these are the top uses um, for this for this type this type of environment for sure. Um, the networking piece, uh, basically starting out at the intranet level, um, a, a privately proprietary owned system um, that literally. It's limited to um, a company, an organization, whatever, um, which then uh, connects to an intra to an extranet system um, to other places in the in the company um, to business partners um, and other folks, uh, other entities that need access to the to those mainframes or whatever or whatever system um which is which brings us to the internet and which is the gateway to, to these things nowadays um one because these used to these this used to be a proprietary network from a particular location at a particular time in a particular way that's how you got to this processing you were able to get to the mainframe for process processing um, as, as the, as things evolved, that network just expanded and was made available, um, to, to be able to get work processed from literally any, any corner of the world. Um, those examples, uh, if you looking to get cash these days, or you're looking to pull out the credit card and put it in typically because of the networking capabilities the security um and and the tracking um and a few other things more than likely the um you're you're coming across a mainframe network at some at some point in time um basically a diagram of uh, how nuts, um, yeah, right, I'm trying. redundancy. Uh, these, uh, in terms of being able to run the same software at multiple locations, um, being able to contact, um, again, various endpoints um, that are connected to these things, um they it's it's worked out pretty pretty well um in terms of on the, the operating system you know some of these things are basically communication servers uh because the machine types like um like small service can can be specialized um SNA systems network architecture was a proprietary IBM system prior to um, the, the use of TCP IP. Um, but basically all these functions, all and any of these functions um, are able to be processed on, um, on the mainframes again these days. Um, one of the main reasons, be, um, the big dumb dinosaurs don't allow a whole lot of access, uh, in terms of, um, x86 machinery, um, type processing machines, other, I'm, um, uh, I should have looked it up, I'm not sure if this includes, uh, something like Mac. These are the different entry points into 
a particular system. There's lots of ways you can get into um, laptops, um, Windows, Macs, whatever. There ain't a whole lot of ways you can access the mainframe. And, and, that's, and that's why it's still in, in great use, particularly with, um, with in industries that process a lot of sensitive data. And I just don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, the security is there, uh, the built-in um, data protection, um, being able to talk to multiple environments um, is, is, a, is a big consideration as to why these things are still around. So, mm. Um, I'll try and speed it up here again before I start hearing hear snoring. Um, the, uh, in terms of online interaction, interacting interaction with the mainframes, um, these are, as I alluded to earlier, these are the various interfaces, uh, the type of screen that one would go to, um, which I knew. Uh, seven ways till Sunday before uh, in terms of being able to process data in real time. Um, again, uh, ISPF, again, which is a template under TSO, uh, which allows for various predetermined functions, how to set up things, um, how to define um, areas of the system, those types of things, sure. Um, pretty much the same thing in terms of setting up, setting up data sets, um, being able to monitor. Um, in the mainframe world these days, um, again, these, these are the ways from from the days of MBS to the ZOS, uh, from TSO, but now with Unix shells uh, coming through using TCP IP, VTAM, um, one of the um, one of the access methods uh, for on, for online data processing uh, through TSO, through Open MBS, through Telnet, and on and on and on and on. Um, in one environment. Um, I think if I remember correctly, I, I remember in, in another meeting, uh, I think it was Glenn who referred to the uh, IBM 1401 system. And this printer, uh, I don't think it was go, went back as far as the 1401s, but it didn't come long after for sure. Um, the output that's one of the things that people look for out of these systems in one way, shape, or another is uh, printing. Uh, no longer as glamorous as it used to be, but these things used to be lined up row after row after row after row in terms of printing large quantities of paper. Um, text-based printing, uh, the old green bar, text-based printing, impact printing on the old green bar paper, uh, things like checks, um, text statements and documents, basically. Uh, to newer um, laser laser printers, just like on the desktop, um, that what that would provide for things like duplex printing, um, printing on both sides of the paper. Um, at one point, uh, this became popular in the late 90s um, so when it came time to 
Oh, make that impact on the budget. Um, if you could take, if you could reduce 10 boxes of paper down to five, we were doing pretty good. And someone was able to keep, and more people were able to keep their jobs. Um, image statements. I don't know who may, who, if anyone still gets a statement from the bank um, or institutions these days. Um, and again, in the mid, in the mid nineties, um, we were able to put together a process of check imaging. The checks that came in on the old sort of machines that were then processed, separated, uh, retained for however long became images on the machine. Um, the paper was no longer necessary because we could keep that image for as long as needed to be legally required. With that, um, the, those images were then placed onto, uh, at the time, paper statements so that the statements uh, no longer came separate, even though in, um, from, from the checks, from the return checks, they were all one document um, before, and then were able to be, again, also be able to be placed online, held for however long. And I couldn't tell you how the last time I saw a printed, a printed statement of mine. Uh, printing services so that um, a company may be able to provide printing services for other companies and other clients um, and on from there. And that brings us to the end. Ah, 839. I ran over time. Good job, Mark.